This is Bishop Gregory Brewer of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida giving the sermon at St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Mulberry, Florida, November 10th, 2013. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that we can gather here in the name of your Son and that it is because of him, his love, his life, his death, his resurrection, that we are welcomed into your presence. Open our hearts and our minds to his presence here as we gather together in his name. You who see all that is in our hearts, come and speak to us and draw us near to you. For we do say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. There are some times when I go to a church to speak, and you look at the lessons, and you can tell one builds on the other. They all kind of cohere into one unit, and because that's the case, the theme is set for you, and it's actually relatively easy. This is not one of those mornings. <laughs> all of the scriptures actually address something very different from each other. So... There's no way that I can actually speak to what's going on in Haggai or in 2 Thessalonians and in the Gospel of Luke. So I'm going to concentrate on the lesson out of Luke this morning because I think it's pertinent. And it has something to say about what it is that we're doing this morning, especially in terms of the service of confirmation. Now you have to think about a little bit this year. You have to think about what's going on. The Sadducees are there to make fun of Jesus. This for them is a joke, and it's not a very kind one. You see, who are the Sadducees? The Sadducees were mostly lawyers. They were people who did not actually believe that there was such a thing as the resurrection of the dead. Um, they were what you and I would presently call agnostics. Yeah, God acted a long time ago. But there's nothing like that going on right now. And so when Jesus would talk about things like resurrection and angels, for them it was like, who is he kidding? They didn't believe anything like that at all. So they devised a scheme, a little story, that they thought would show the ridiculousness of any idea of an afterlife. Because there wasn't any. That's what, you see, they believed. And the way Luke sets up this story there are, a whole, there are all these groups who come, the Pharisees come, the chief priests and scribes come, and finally the Sadducees come, each of whom are trying to stump him, to discredit him, because Jesus is wildly popular, far more popular than any of these groups with the crowds. Huge crowds are coming to see him. Extraordinary miracles are being manifested right in front of them. I mean, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. He says things that are astonishingly brilliant. And so therefore, for each of those groups, including the Sadducees who are showing up in today's lesson, he's a profound threat. Um, he's doing it better than they did. And the crowds know it. And so it, it's as if, you know, if we want to keep our standing in this community, we need to go after them. So they're all trying. And the, the Sadducees are the last of the groups. So they come and they think they've done something really brilliant. We'll, we'll create this sort of hypothetical story just to show how ridiculous any idea of an afterlife really is. So they spin this little yarn. And you need to know, as they're telling the story, they're snickering. They, they think, we've got it with this one. And so they tell the story. And it's based on Mosaic Law. Because the Mosaic Law was that if a man and a woman unite in marriage, and the man dies, and they have the, there are no heirs, meaning, and not only are there no heirs, there's no one to grow up to take care of this woman in her widowhood, then another brother would come and marry her with the hope of producing an heir and children that would come and take care of this woman in her old age. So they spin this rather, okay, here's the story, Jesus. Tell me what you think. A man and a woman die, I'm sorry, men and women marry, and they don't have children. Can't have kids, I guess. The man dies. What's the status of this woman? 
She might be cursed by God because she can't have kids, because that was a part of what they would think. And there's nobody going to take care of her. So she is bereft in every way, shape, or form. So what happens? According to the law, another brother comes and marries her. Same thing happens. The woman goes through seven husbands. No wonder the woman dies too. <laughs> and see, that's exactly what they're doing. People are laughing as he tells the story. So they're saying, Jesus, if there is this resurrection from the dead, if eternal life actually happens, whose husband is this woman? Like, aha. Uh -huh. Well, Jesus says, you don't know what you're talking about, in essence. First of all, you need to know, he says, marriage is God's institution for this life, not for the next. In other words, marriage is temporary. And even within, sort of, let me stepping aside from Jesus, even within the Christian church, we look at marriage as a vocational calling. Some people are called to marriage. Some people are, in fact, not called to marriage. And within the sight of God, there are, None are considered better off than another. In other words, marriage is a temporary institution. It's not permanent. It's not carried over into eternity. In fact, Jesus says when this story is told in the in Gospel of Matthew, he looks at the Sadducees and he says, you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. That's, that's what this stupid story is in fact showing us about you. So he says, those who belong to this age, in other words, right now, not talking about eternal life. They're the ones who marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in the age to come, hint, hint, maybe that's not you, Sadducees, because you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, that's the point of what he's trying to infer. He said, those in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry or given a marriage. That's a part of this life. It's not a part of the next. Why is that? They can't die anymore. Everything is permanent at that point. And marriage by its very nature is not permanent as in terms of carrying over into the next life. Why is that? Because they're like the angels of God. They're, they're children of the resurrection. In other words, their chemistry has changed, we would say. I mean, if you remember the stories of Jesus when he appears after his resurrection, post-Easter, He's not the same. He looks the same, yes, but he does things nor no uh, regular human would do, like appear through a wall that was closed. We can't do that. We didn't see Jesus do that. But on the other side of the resurrection, the disciples are gathered in locked doors because they're afraid they're going to get arrested. And Jesus just suddenly appears in front of them. There is a different thing that's going on with a resurrected body than a regular, normal body. So Jesus is saying, they're like the angels. See, the angels can just appear. You know the angel stories. They just show up out of nowhere. They're not the same anymore. So marriage is just not a part of that. And then he goes on to make the point. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses, who by the way, Sadducees, you think is okay, Moses shows, and he tells the story of the burning bush. What does God say to Moses? He doesn't say, I will be, or I was, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I am. In other words, God, by his very nature, is someone who exists in relationship. So for him to say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, means Guess what? I still talk to them. They still talk to me. In other words, sure they're dead as far as the world is concerned, but in my eternity, they are alive. So to know, and here's the point, in other words, to be in a relationship with God means to be in an eternal relationship with God. That once Christ comes into your life, you're brought in baptism. You are made a child of God, an heir of the kingdom of heaven. That relationship between you and him is permanent. Paul says in Romans, not even death can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if someone comes to you and says, are you going to go to heaven when you die? 
Oh, <coughs> what do you answer? Yes. <laughs> Why? Because a relationship with God is permanent. If I really am His, if I've been made His child, that means I can count on the fact that no matter what happens in this life, He will never leave me or forsake me. He will always be with me. As Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even the devil himself. As we said in the colic, he actually came to destroy the works of the devil. In other words, no matter what comes at me, whether we're talking about demonic power, whether we're talking about good or bad circumstances, whether we, we are even talking about someone being killed or dying, God's power, His presence, His life, is always holding us in the palm of our, his hand, no matter what it is that we go through. So that even when the body finally collapses and dies, for whatever reason, whether it be disease, whether it feel untimely to us, whether it be old age, in God's eyes, no matter what happens in terms of the circumstances of death, we are still kept by his power and grace and literally ushered into the eternal life that is, in fact, already ours because his eternal life lives inside of us. I think that's pretty wonderful. Do you think that's pretty yeah. wonderful? I mean, so I don't know what's going to happen to you today. Could be good, could be not so good. There is nothing that's going to happen to you today that will alter in any way God holding you and keeping you in the palm of his hand. You belong to him. He will never, ever let you go. And when someone that you love dies, passes away, if that person is a Christian, you can say with all confidence, I will look forward to seeing you in heaven. In other words, because the promises of God, all that has happened in Jesus is ours and that will never change. So that that means I know that wherever I am, whatever I go through, where God's there. He is with me. I will never leave you or forsake you. Do you always feel God's presence? The answer is no. And sometimes what God has to do is in some ways, sometimes even take away our feelings about him. Because he wants us to have our faith in him, not how we're feeling. And God's promise is, I will be with you no matter what. Which means, even if I feel God's presence, he's there. Even if I don't feel God's presence, he's still there. And he's still there just as much. God never... Come up here, let me show you something. See... She doesn't mind. You don't mind me having you up here. No, no I didn't think so. <laughs> so there are times when God is like, we feel him right here. And it's great. There are other times when we feel like God's gone over here. That's what our feelings tell us. But the truth of the matter is, is that God is just as close, even if he feels like he's far away. Because sometimes my feelings aren't accurate. You see, we use our feelings to help sort of tell us what's real and what's not in the world, right? That's a part of what it means to be human. Yes? Nod your head. Yes. You're with me? Yes. Okay, thanks. But the fact of the matter is, is that we are, we are broken, fallen human beings. We are imperfect. We don't always get it right. Isn't that always true? Yeah. If you think you're right 100% of the time, you're in the wrong building. <laughs> <laughs> the same is true for our feelings. There are times when we feel God's presence and it's wonderful. You know, the peace that passes all understanding. The fruit of the Spirit in our life. His love and His joy. It's terrific. I wouldn't trade it for anything. There's sometimes when I get up where even after having my coffee, I don't feel anything at all. <laughs> Does that mean God said, oh, you've not done pretty well today, so I'm, uh, I'll, I'll leave you until you get better. That's how we interpret. We interpret an absence of feelings that somehow God is after us, or he doesn't like us, or we've done something wrong, and so he's decided to step away because he doesn't approve of who we are or what it is that we're doing. Nothing is further from the truth. 
Yes, sometimes our behavior makes it difficult for us to access God's presence. Sin does that. But it's only access, because He's still right here. If nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, including death, which is the point of the lesson this morning, then that means nothing that I have done Get this? Nothing that I have done can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Because his forgiveness, his love, his constancy is never interrupted by my behavior. It affects me. It affects me a lot. I mean, guilt, fear, all those things happen. That's a part of what it means to pay the consequences of sin in our lives. But God is always ready, right there, to forgive. Not so he can come back close again, because he's never left. But to give us that capacity again, to receive what he is always, consciously, what he's always pouring into us. You see, the promise of eternal life and resurrection, this is the point with this I'll stop, is not just a promise for what happens after you die, although it is that. If that were true, you could say, oh, that means I can just do whatever I want, and then when I die, I'll go to heaven, right? No, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> see? No, no, no. The constancy of his presence and the fact that love is stronger than death, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, is the promise that we need here and now, so that no matter what happens to us, or no matter even what we do, we know that we're still kept by him, that his forgiveness is always present, no matter what we do, and that he will continue to hold us and be in relationship with us, no matter what we go through. So that it's literally God's resurrection promise now, right here, for you and me. That's a lot. That's wonderful. That's, that's why I gave my life to Christ. Because no one else can make those promises. No one. That's why we're confirming. Because they've said yes to Jesus. And they know that the constancy of his presence will never leave them. So they're willing to say, I'll serve that one. I'll sign up for him. You see, that's why there's joy in what it means to be a Christian. It's anything but dull. It's actually quite exciting. Because that means I can enter into life knowing that I am never alone. Can it get difficult? Yeah. You'll see me. One of the signs of confirmation is they get a little slap on the cheek. They know that, by the way. <laughs> and I said, because there are times when standing for Christ can create difficulty. Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulation. As I said to them, confirmation is not for whiners. But the point is, is that literally no matter what you go through, he's still there. He is still there, and he will be faithful. I say all of that because not only are they being confirmed, you are reaffirming your own commitments to Christ in this service as well. And I want you to know there is no better place where you can put your trust than eternity. There is no one stronger than Jesus who will guide you and forgive you and bring you through everything that life brings your way, which is sometimes really awful. And that no matter the circumstances of your death, you will have a place in eternity. That's what we remember. That's what we give thanks for today. That we are his, that nothing can separate us from him, and that he will never let us go. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that in this room, this morning, you are here. And that nothing can separate us from your love. Oh Lord, for those here who are filled with guilt and fear, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would come and bring forgiveness and draw them near to you. Give them the power to lead a new life where they forsake sin and choose righteousness. For those who are afraid of death, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would come and bring your love 
and let them know that you will lead them through even the valley of the shadow of death and that you will not leave them and you will lead them safely into eternity. And Lord, today for those who feel separated from those who they're really worried about, I pray you who are the Lord of the whole earth, not just right here, would come and bring your presence to them and bring both the people they pray for as well as themselves, your power and your grace and your mercy. Because nothing can separate us from you. And so we thank you that we are yours. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen.